Well, hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Wild Neighbor Speaker Series. We're happy to have you. My name is Jaya Torres. I'm with Austin Water Wildland Conservation Division. This series is a collaboration with Travis County Natural Resources, who co-manages the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve with us. Today, we're happy to have Joe Lapp, or Spider Joe, a self-taught spider taxonomist and nature educator in Austin, Texas. He studies spiders, teaches people about spiders, and develops software to support uh, arthropod and invertebrate conservation at UT Austin. So Joe, I'll hand it over to you. Hello, everybody. So yeah, I'm Joe Lapp. Uh, you can call me Spider Joe is what um, a lot of people know me as, and even my friends will introduce me to their friends as Spider Joe. Okay, I'm going to get my screen sharing going here. All right. OK, so today I have a brand new presentation for you. Um, so often in my programs, I'm asked, how did I get into spiders? And I actually used to hate spiders. I grew up most of my life hating spiders. And, um, and it's, there's actually a bit of a story to it. And I've never really had time to tell it in any of my programs. And so that's what this is going to be. I'm going to tell you the story of how I uh, got into spiders and all the amazing things I learned along the way, or some of them anyway. So, OK, let's get started here. So yeah, the spider that you saw in that front page, it looks like uh, a Muppet to me. And uh, these two look very similar. In fact, this is the male of uh, Platycryptus and Dottis, and the other one was the female. There's the female, and here's the male. And I, I just think they, these, some of these jumping spiders look like Muppets. So I grew up loving butterflies. In fact, it seems to like it was passed down from generation to generation. Uh, my dad's mom, my granddad's mom, my granddad, and then my my mom and then me, and we're all into butterflies and butterfly gardens and learning all the names. And, and I, I loved all insects and um, most invertebrates probably, and except spiders. Spiders were an exception for me. <clears throat> I did not like spiders. Uh, my dad was so proud that he could kill spiders with his thumb. And, you know, he'd go around bragging to everyone that he killed a big spider with his thumb. And, and whenever there was a spider in the house, we, we had to like rearrange the furniture to get at it. And then, you know, I was doing that. When I lived on my own, I started doing that. Oh no, I saw a spider. And I would like move all the furniture, remove everything until I found that one spider, then I would squish it. And uh, yeah, I was afraid of spiders. I did not like them for a very long time until around the age, let's see, I'm gonna guess I might've been 31. So it all started with a jumping spider for me. Uh, I had a friend who brought, who came to my door. And when she came in the house, she had this, this isn't a photo of that spider, but she had a jumping spider on her hand. And I was telling her to get that spider out of the house. She found it on my porch and she says, no, I'm not taking, she says, I'm not taking it out until you hold it. And I'm like, I am not holding the spider. And she says, you have to hold it or I'm not taking it out. And I'm like arguing with you. You've got to take that out. Take that spider out right now. And so she's holding the spider up between us. It's sitting on the center of her palm and we're arguing. And whenever she talks, the spider turns and looks at her. And whenever I talk, the spider turns and looks at me. And it was just, we were having this argument and the spider was just sitting there politely listening to both of us, taking turns, watching whoever was speaking. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. The spider did not bite her. I was like, okay, I'm gonna hold the spider for a second just to get, get it out of the house. So I, I held it for a second. It didn't bite me, I was fine. And then she took it out. Well, after that, I could never, kill a spider again. I couldn't kill spiders anymore. So the jumping spiders I've, I've learned to see are quite adorable sometimes, um, like this one here. And um, so from this point on, I would catch the spiders. Whenever I saw a spider, I would catch it in the cup. I still had to get it out of the house. 
I would catch it in a cup, I'd slip something under the cup and take it outside and dump it outside. And so, uh, so my journey towards spiders had started. I, I couldn't kill them anymore. I couldn't squish them anymore. And this one was begging me not to squish them, but at the time I took this photo, I was no longer squishing them. But so, um, and then some of these spiders are just cute. I, I've got a lot of photos of cute spiders and I'm just gonna, I don't have them all here with me anymore uh, for this program. So I'm gonna, so for the next part of this story here. So I'm, I'm still living in the same house. And I find a, a big wolf spider just walking down the middle of the hall. And so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to take it outside very carefully. So I put a cup over it. I slid something under it. And I went out on the porch. It wasn't this, it might have been this species. I'm not sure. It was, certainly wasn't this spider. I went out on the front porch. And from like maybe two inches above the concrete, I let it drop onto the, onto the concrete porch. Well, this was a wolf spider. And it was had babies all over its abdomen. And so this is this spider here has babies clinging to its abdomen. And when that spider fell on the porch, this, the babies scattered. They fell off her. And she just stood there. And the babies gradually found each other, gradually formed lines, which became single file long, lines onto each of her eight legs. And I was watching these little babies form single file lines to climb up their mom's legs. They climbed onto her abdomen. And when they were all back on her abdomen, every single one, the mama spider walked away. I could not believe it. That just blew me away. Still, I did not like spiders, could not kill them, but you know, getting a little closer. So anyway, so the little spiders, they carry their egg sacs around until the, the spiders are ready to hatch. And then the wolf spider actually opens the egg sac for them. And then they climb out and then she protects them for a while. She doesn't feed them. They have yolk that they use, but she protects them for a while until they're old enough to be on their own. And so, and then I moved to Austin. Still wasn't into spiders. I was into butterflies. And I don't know how many folks know Dan Hardy, but he's really into butterflies. And he and I spent some time hanging out but he's a well-rounded naturalist and he had all sorts of interesting facts about everything to share, including facts about spiders. It's, okay, so they look like Muppets to me. Here's a, here's a butterfly. <laughs> this is where I talked about butterflies. And you might know something about the harvester butterfly and why I chose this one. Um, then I, I didn't like, I grew up not liking spiders. But then there is a spider that um, my friend brought in and here's a cute jumping spider. <clears throat> and then here's a wolf spider. So here's my wolf spider story. Here's the mother with the babies. Okay, and then this is the trash line orb weaver. So, um, so Dan explained to me that um, this spider here uh, keeps remnants, remains of its prey, and then ties them together with silk and puts them in a line on its web. And the reason it does that is because there are wasps that come and take the spider. They prey on the spider or they grab the spider and feed it to their larva. And if there are decoys in the web that look just like the spider, the wasp has trouble finding the spider. And so it gives the spider a better chance of getting away from the wasp. And so here's a close-up of this spider, Cyclosa turbinata, um, in her in her web. Sometimes they make actual what look like decoys, you know, um, actual um, versions of her and little blobs of her elsewhere in the web, which I think is awesome. So here's an, another fact: and uh, these zigzags that these spiders, that these um, black and yellow garden spiders make out of silk. Um, and there are multiple possible reasons they do this. And some arachnologists will disagree with each other on what they're for based on the studies they've done. But it's probably the case that it serves many functions. And the functions include keeping birds from flying through the web and wrecking it. So if they wreck the web, they can't catch anything. 
And I've actually seen this. I saw a bird fly straight towards one of these zigzags and make like a 90 degree turn in midair, like a foot in front of it and go straight up. So I know, these, I know the bird saw that web. Another explanation is that it reflects UV light and like many flowers reflect UV patterns. And so it might attract pollinators um, to the web. Another explanation is it helps to hide or camouflage the spider. And you can see that better on, on this web here. This is a young black and yellow garden spider, uh, only like uh, a centimeter long maybe. And they, they don't make quite the zigzag. They make more of a, um, I guess, a, a doily of sorts um, in the web. Um, and they do kind of blend in with it. And there have been other explanations that have been given as well. Like it allows them to switch sides and get away from, switch sides of the web and get away from a predator. So another interesting fact Dan had to share with me was um, that there are these little um, spiders, these tiny little spiders in these giant webs um, called dewdrop spiders. And they kind of glisten silver, but they're kleptoparasites. They feed on food they find, little food they find in the big spider's web. And they're very pretty. And they all have racing stripes like this, or most of them do. And I think the reason they have racing stripes is because they have to be able to get away from the big spider really fast if that big spider starts moving. And they do, they do. They get move fast when that spider starts moving. So Dan said, well, I have this book called Biology of Spiders. Would you like to read it? And I see that you're getting interested in spiders. I'm like, no, no. Spiders are not butterflies. You know, butterflies are pretty. Spiders, not so pretty. So no, I'm not really ready to read that book. And then I still also didn't like spiders. Um, I was scared of them. And then um, I, I um, so I love to go for walks at McKinney Ruffs Nature Park. And um, I would bring my dogs. And it took me like half an hour to prepare for these walks because of everything I pack and to get my dogs ready and dogs, dog treats ready and dog water. And, and then it took me at that time, we didn't have this nice junction. It took me like 40 minutes to get there. And then when I got there, it took me like 10 or 15 minutes to get to the start of the walk that we'd like to do. So I had this like hour and a half preparation time or so. And when I got there with my two dogs, this is what I saw to part of the trail that I like to walk. And uh, this is the, the river path, actually. It had this caution tape over it. And I'm like, all this preparation to get here and I can't do my walk. I'm like, gosh, dang it, okay. I'll be cautious do not do this for yourself. That caution tape's there for a reason. But I said, I'll be cautious. And I slipped under the caution tape and found out why the tape was there. The river had been over the trail for like the prior two weeks and it was just receding. And the trail was really muddy. Well, the first part of this trail hill is downhill. And at that time, my dogs were not well-trained. They'd not trained to heal. And so they would just pull me. I was on mud, the dogs were pulling, and I was just skiing down this trail. No one had been on this trail in two weeks. On a trail that people have been on, you know, the, the day before, overnight, the trail covers with spiders, you know, spider webs cross the trail. After two weeks, you've got two weeks worth of spider webs crossing this trail. And I had dogs pulling me, and all I could do was grab trees periodically and to keep them from pulling me through these webs. And I, at this point, I was able to knock down the webs before I went through them. But I could see my dogs plowing through web after web after web. Let me show you. So this is actually a photo I took um, a few years later, but it gives you the idea. So you can kind of see my, my two dogs on the other side of this web. And then here's a Microthena gracilis, a spider in front. So these are the kinds of webs that were there. And I could see my dog plowing, my dogs plowing through web after web. I would see the spiders on my dogs. And I would see the spiders walk to the side of my dog and drop. Every single one left my dog. It got off my dog as soon as possible. And so I was like, wow, the spiders are just leaving the dogs alone. They're getting off. And, and so at this point in the trail, I'm like, I, I um, you know, I, uh, I, I stayed clear of spiders. And then we got to a point where it was flat. I could walk on my own. It wasn't so muddy. And I could slow down and the mosquitoes started descending on me. 
I looked at my arms. It was like there was a carpet of mosquitoes on my arms, like a carpet. <laughs> and there were still spider webs ahead of me on the trail. And so I said, dang it, I'm just going to run through these webs. So I ran through the spider webs. For the first time in my life, I just ignored the webs. You know, I didn't care about the spiders. I ran through these spider webs to get through, to get away from these mosquitoes. And, and so this is, you know, one of the spiders. Um, in fact, I think, yeah, I think this is a, a photo I took. Um, I think this is a photo I took um, the very um, day of that um, event. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, yeah, so I ran through spiders and, um, and to get out of there. And after that, I was no longer afraid of spiders. At that point, I was interested in spiders. I was no longer afraid of them. And, um, but I still you know, wasn't into, into them. You know, they weren't that pretty. Then we went on a hike. This was also at McKinney Ruffs. I went on a hike with Sierra Club. And Sierra Club, they like to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. And so we're moving along, really moving along. And I come around a corner and I see this. This is the exact photo I saw. This is the photo I took on that day of this giant lichen orbiter. The abdomen is maybe three quarters of an inch in diameter. It's a really big spider. And, and the, the rest of the hikers are coming around me and they bump into me because I'm around the corner as they're going around. And they bump into me and I'm, I stop and I'm like gawking at this. I start taking some photos. Everybody else goes in front of me, got my photos. It took me half an hour to catch up with the group again. <laughs> so anyway, uh, at this point I was like, wow, that is a beautiful spider. It's like a, like a moss covered river stone hanging in the air. It's like, wow, spiders can be beautiful. So I went back to Dan. Dan, loan me that book. <laughs> and I read that book straight through. Um, and it was just fascinating. So at this point, spiders were better than butterflies because I had have, have collected all these books on butterflies all over my life. I'd never read a single one straight through. I read this one straight through. And then I picked up a few more spider books and read them straight through. So spiders had become better for me than butterflies at this point. And uh, just so you know, here's the current edition of that book. It's just a fascinating book. It's really dense, but amazing. It's just amazing. And it's, it's a pretty big book. Um, Biology of Spiders, Reno Felix. So, so I started getting people asking me to, to teach about spiders. I did a, a program for Austin Butterfly Forum. A lot of teachers showed up, elementary school teachers. They started inviting me to classes. Other people started inviting me to programs. Parks started inviting me. So I started teaching mostly kids uh, about spiders um, all over town. And um, I, I did some adult programs too. Kids are really energizing for me though, because every program is just really different with kids. With adults, adults tend to ask similar questions. Not as entertaining, um, but um, I really got into to teaching. And uh, teaching has its perks. So nice things happen. So one of the kids drew a portrait of me, which captures me perfectly, gets my, my crooked nose and my crooked smile exactly right. <laughs> and, uh, and I started holding spiders too. I, you know, uh, this is a jumping spider I had on my palm. And, um, <clears throat> but I, I'm not afraid to hold any spider really. So here's another uh, giant huntsman that I held. Um, this was at um, Zookeeper up north, but I've raised them as well and held them. And, um, and so there's one spider I don't hold though. So I really got into spiders, but I was still afraid of these black widows. And I brought one home, I wanted to photograph it and I put it in a little tub and I've got a chopstick or two chopsticks, I guess. And I'm trying to, and it, it, it put it in a tub and it rolled up into a ball like this. And I'm like, come on, I wanna get a nice photo of you. And it just stayed in this ball, like don't hurt me, don't hurt me, don't hurt me. And I'm like pushing it around with the chopsticks and I can't get it to unroll. But I'm also shaking. Like this is the first time I'm working with a black widow. I'm like visibly shaking. I'm kind of scared of working with it. <clears throat> but the thing was scared of me too. <laughs> so, and that was my first experience with the black widow. I did get some nice photos of her. And then I, I kept black widows for many years after that. Um, <clears throat> and some other cool things too. I started photographing spiders and learning to identify them. 
And this is the first photo of a live um, 3DN Lano. Uh, very tiny spider, maybe half a millimeter long. And uh, it's a beautiful spider. So, you know, I got into them, I learned how to identify them, started photographing them, and, you know, I found, I started photographing things that have never been photographed before. It's pretty amazing. I even achieved stardom to some degree. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen this on social media. This is mine. These are all my photos. Um, this this uh, meme has been shared millions of times on Twitter and Facebook, millions. Every year it gets shared again. Um, <clears throat> so and I'm just blown away by spider diversity. That's one of the amazing things I love about them is just that everything is so different. They, they make different kinds of webs. They look different. They hunt differently. Um, they have, they're just different strategies and they just, they're just amazingly diverse. Um, so, but I wanted to be able to identify them. And, um, and I thought these crab spiders were really beautiful and they had all these patterns and I'm pulling up these field guides. The field guides are really general at that time, were really general. They could, they could help you to family, they could help you get a few species, but you couldn't identify very much. It wasn't like a uh, field guide to butterflies or birds or dragonflies or anything. And so I had to learn to identify them on my own. And I'm like, wow, these crab spiders are beautiful. I want to know what these different patterns and colors mean. Uh, which species have these different patterns and colors? So I really dove into it. I got some help from another arachnologist I met under the trees you see in my background. Those trees are covered in spider webs. Um, that's a whole other story. <clears throat> And uh, he, he taught me to dissect spiders, um, which is necessary in particular for identifying females. And so I learned to identify spiders. I would take photographs of them live, and then I would put them under a microscope and dissect them and pull up all sorts of literature, trying to figure out what they are. And I wanted to put, I posted it on Bug Guide to say, this is what they look like. And unfortunately, there are only a few color patterns that, um, that, um, always seem to correspond to particular species. They're so variable. One species can vary so much depending on, you know, on its, on its local habitat. And, um, you know, whether it's been on a flower or a bush or something, they're just so variable. It's really hard to identify them. So I only made a little progress there, but I learned a whole lot. And oh, here's a male, the males are awesome. They all know Kung Fu, they're great at jumping. <clears throat> And I even discovered some new species. This is a new species I discovered. I, the spider that you see here, I collected at Austin Nature and Science Center. And um, it turned out to be undescribed. Uh, didn't have a name at that time. And I've since looked for and found many more. They mainly live in the trees, which is probably why people don't see them very often and they weren't known before. They're mainly living in the trees. Um, but um, uh, an arachnologist friend of mine described the species and named it after me, and I helped him with some of the work for that. Um, <clears throat> and I discovered this is the species here is at Hornsby Bend. It's pretty common at Hornsby Bend near the ponds, and it's undescribed. It has no name. I have one or two more other crab spiders I've seen locally that I don't think have names, like that I can't identify them. And so I went on this effort to try to figure out these, uh, what these are, and I learned how to identify crab spiders really well. And you, we get to know each other in the, in the arachnological community. And so we kind of know who's working on what. And, and I got to a point where I was the only practicing tax, taxonomist on uh, working with, I was only, let me say this, only uh, practicing North American crab spider taxonomist. Um, the other person, Charles Dondale, had retired like 10 years earlier. <laughs> he was still available, but I was the only person actually working on them. And so I had the opportunity to write this chapter for the new version of the book that arachnologists use to identify spiders to genus in North America, North of Mexico. And so I actually got to rewrite this chapter, and um, which is uh, basically a dichotomous key for the crab spiders. And I just happened to become the expert. I was trying to figure out what these, you know, how to identify these crab spiders. It, it, I just happened to fall there. So I've learned that really spiders aren't so bad neighbors after all. They're, they're everywhere. They're our neighbors no matter what, you can't help it. And they're good neighbors to get to know. 
And I've, I've really learned to love them and enjoy them and appreciate them. And they're just, when they come in the house, I'm just excited, like as excited as if a butterfly had come into the house because I know something about them. Knowing some of their names, I can associate four different things with what they're doing and I can start to collect information about individual species. And it just builds up, it gets really interesting. So, so yeah, but don't spiders bite? Spiders do bite, but I've had so much experience with spiders that I think I've developed my own rules for when they bite. I kind of figured out when they bite and when they won't. So I'm just gonna share these rules with you. So spiders bite when they're pinned or squished, okay? That's the main way people get bitten by spiders. A spider does not want to be squished, okay? They die. <laughs> they die if they get squished. And they're pretty fragile too. They die if they get squished. So, <clears throat> um, so that's the main way people like, they, they might have like a spider in their shirt or in their pants or something. And it, it won't bite them just being there. But if you lean against something or put your arm against your shirt and it's in, the, it's in, it's in that spot, it's like, I'm, I'm gonna die, what do I do? And it just tries biting something. And it might bite you if it does that. And, and, <clears throat> and so that, that's probably the main way that we accidentally get bitten. Another way to get bitten is if you tickle their web and they think you're an insect. Spiders that live in webs don't see very well. They have eight, most of them have eight eyes, but they don't use their eyes to make images or to, to discern prey. They, they listen to the web to understand their world. They use their eyes mainly to see whether it's night or day, to see movement and shadows. Um, <clears throat> but so you can fool a spider into thinking you're an insect. And this is how people used to get bitten a lot by um, um, black widows. Is if you, you put your hand someplace where you're not looking and you accidentally tickle the spider's web, the spider might come out and bite you. If you wreck the web, the spider's gonna be like, whoa, there's a hurricane, there's a tornado and it runs and hides. But if you tickle the web, they might think, hey, that might be dinner and it might come out and bite. <clears throat> um, and then the spider can bite if it's been ex excessively harassed. Spiders, they all have personalities, different personalities. They all have moods. So a spider can start out you know, nice and, and relaxed, but then you start pushing it around and it gets annoyed. And if you get annoyed enough, it gets annoyed enough, it might bite, you know, and let you know, hey, leave me alone, you know? Hey, but cats do that too. So. <laughs> You know, so, um, but they avoid people because they know how tasty they are and they just know you want to eat them. So they're going to run and hide. <clears throat> and um, so, okay, so hopefully I've whet your appetite a little about spiders. So there's a nice field guide that's out. It's kind of expensive. It has drawings of many species. It's um, Common Spiders of North America by Richard Bradley. <clears throat> and um, it's a beautiful book. But there's another field guide in the works. Um, and um, Dr. Sarah Rose is producing it, and it's going to be all photos, and I've contributed a few of them. I think it's going to be a really nice guide, and I'm looking forward to coming out. Um, <clears throat> and so I'll take questions at this point. Awesome. That was just so much cool information, and your photography is just amazing. Thank you. Um, that, and that kind of rolls into the first question. The very first question somebody asked is, can you briefly describe your photography setup for, for these critters? Yeah. So I'm not a very good photographer, okay? So you'll notice that most of these spiders are on a white background. So what I do is I, um, I have a white tub. It, it can be a bathtub. I used to use a bathtub for a long time. And then for a while I had a bathtub in my kitchen on a cart. So I could stand and photograph spiders in the bathtub. Uh, now I just use a plastic tub. So I just, I keep this camera at basically the same settings. It's a digital SLR and I just, I don't really understand what I'm doing. I, I, I fidget with the settings until it's a decent, they're decent settings. And then I just stick with those settings and hope I don't have to change them. And it gets, it gets nice photos. And then I use, um, I do have another camera that I use for outdoor photos. These days for out, outside stuff, when I need a little camera that, that is smarter than I am, well, when I don't need to be smarter than the camera to use it, I use this thing. Um, this is uh, an Olympus, uh, what is it called? Tough, I guess. There's a, a new version of it out, oh, TG5. I think the TG6 is out. It does amazing macro work. It's, it's like, it's designed for us uh, bug people. It's just wonderful. Um, 
That's that question. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the next one was, so the male and female seem so different. How do you know who's made it to whom? I'm, I'm assuming they're thinking within species. How can you tell the male and female apart? I mean, it just seems to get so difficult. Okay. Um, I'm going to share a different screen. Hold on just a second. So this is another talk I do, and now I need to enlarge it. So uh, okay. So the main way to tell so um, this here is a, a jumping spider. So spiders are they're arachnids. And all arachnids have 10 appendages, 10. In the spiders, eight of them are legs. And two of them are pedipalps. And the pedipalps are different between the males, the adult males and females. <clears throat> so this is kind of what they might look like in an adult female. They're, they're kind of boring. They just look like these little, little arms here. Tyrannosaurus rex arms is what I tell the kids. But in an adult male, so we got a good photo here. <clears throat> uh, let's find an analogous photo. <clears throat> uh, hmm. I guess this presentation doesn't have a good one. Okay, in the adult male, this isn't a. Can't see it. Well, this is not the prettiest of spiders. <laughs> But you can see here that the palp is different at the end. It, it has a different structure at the end. Um, so basically, it's the palp. Do I have another few? I don't have any males in here. Oh, and I've got the spider, the crab spider. So I don't know if you can see here, but these crab spiders have largish distal palps. So they're, they're like box, boxing gloves on the ends. And they use them for mating. Uh, they inseminate the females with them. Um, um, but you only see them in adults. And that's the main uh, uh, difference. That's the main difference we look for. The females have an epigynum under, un, epigynum underneath is the way we pronounce that, um, that we can look for. That's harder to see. Uh, if you are familiar with the species, you can also go by what they look like sometimes. Like for many species, males don't get above a certain size. Like with the garden spider, um, the males are, are limited in size and the females get really big. So once they're above a certain size, you know it's female. And then sometimes they just look different. Like this is the male. This right here just looks very different from the female, which is over in the other talk. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, they're just, they, they, can, they can just look different sometimes. I don't know, does that answer the question? Yeah, no, I think that's good with the boxing gloves. And like you said, okay. size, if I see the giant like an orb breather, the big giant one, I'm like, oh, that's a female. You know? <laughs> Usually there are some species where the males and females are about the same size. Um, the giant like an orb breather is one of them, <laughs> but the females get larger abdomens than the males. Um, okay. The, ne the next question is really interesting. It's something that we've done a lot with after the winter storms, but it's, do you have any information about how that big freeze that we have may have affected the spider populations in our area? I can tell you about a personal little experiment I did, and that's about as far as I can do. Well, so first of all, I used to think that, that it's the temperature that kills the spiders at the end of the year. It's not. They just have their natural life cycles. They die at a certain time. Um, <clears throat> whether it's warm or cold, they just, they're just a certain time. But I did a little experiment at Hornsby. I knew we were gonna, I knew it was gonna freeze overnight at Hornsby, Hornsby Bend. And so the day before I went out and I walked along one of the, the trails along the pond. And I did a count of all the, the spiders I could find and I kept track. And then we had a freeze overnight. Uh, lasted three hours, four hours or so. And then the next day, I went and did the count again to see what I found. I found all but one spider. <laughs> and the one spider that was missing is uh, a garden spider, um, the banded garden spider. 
um, our guide vitri fasciata, that was missing, one of the bigger spires. That was the only one that was missing. So I don't know. I mean, if, it, if the freeze lasts for many days, it's got to kill a number of them. But many of them know how to find their way into places that where they won't freeze. And many of them have built-in antifreeze. But for like, we had this last winter where we had like three or four days it didn't get above freezing. Yeah, that probably got a lot of them, but I don't really have firsthand evidence for you. Perfect. Um, this next one is if I, take a, and if I take a photo of a spider that I can't identify it, can I email it to you to look at? So this might be a good time for you to maybe introduce iNaturalist really quick um, so you don't get inundated with just hundreds of photographs. <laughs> Yeah, sure. If you're local to Austin, feel free to email me. I'm happy to help. Um, and uh, so erect, I can pull up that slide again. Um, um, but you, there's also bug guide in iNaturalist. Now, I'm going to recommend bug guide if you want an ID. I'm not going to recommend iNaturalist for spiders. iNaturalist is probably getting better, but when I was last involved with them, I just spent most of my time trying to clean up the IDs because on a naturalist, it's done by voting. And then when one person votes, other people come and they tend to vote the same way. And so you can reinforce the wrong ID and it's hard to correct things. Um, but over time, I think it gradually improves. But bug guide is um, more of a, um, uh, a curated guide and you can, you can trust those spiders and they've got great information. So, but otherwise you can just email it to me and. Um, email photo me, I'll be happy to, if you're local to Austin, that'd be great, or Central Texas, that'd be great. Great. Um, so next up, are there reasons slash theories as to why they have so many and so large of eyes? And then we also had a comment in the chat that was like, you said they have eight eyes, but it seems like all of your pictures only have four eyes. So do you <laughs> want to talk about eyes a little bit? That's great. <laughs> That's observant. I love to, I love I love to hear. Yeah, um, I love this being this observant. Like when I'm working with kids, sometimes I'll um, I'll give the kid I'll, I put spiders in jars and pass them around, and I'll tell them to count the legs. Well, they all come in. Spiders have eight legs. I say count the legs, and I know when they've counted because some of these spiders lose legs. And if they tell me eight and the spider has seven or six or five, I know they didn't count. So I'm teaching observation skills, and so great observation skills. Uh, thank you for that. So, yeah, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I have another talk here. I'm pull up another. I'm just gonna pull up another talk. <laughs> Quick. Uh, oops. Let me see if I can find it here. So we tend to. Most spiders have. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I gotta get it going. Uh, where is it? <clears throat> Most spiders have eight eyes, um, but some can have six, some can have four, some can have two, some have none. Uh, they are found in caves. Uh, some of them are found in caves. Well, let me say it this way. Some of the cave spiders have no eyes. And where is my... So I think this is an old one. So... I'm going to try this spider. This. Yeah, here we go. OK, so I'm going to share a different presentation with you now. Did it pull up? Still just seeing you right now. OK, and I've lost the presentation. Hold on. I've lost Zoom. Hold on. OK. Where'd it go? There it is. Okay. Okay, so there are different configurations of eyes. And so here's what you're seeing mostly in these jumping spider photos. There are four forward facing eyes, but they have four eyes, they're two on the sides and back of their heads too. Um, they make great, great babysitters. They can see what's going on from all directions. But so, yeah, different spiders use the different eyes for different functions. Now, the jumping spiders, they see better than all the other spiders. Those forward-facing eyes 
they actually have retinas that have muscles attached to them and they can move them around to look in different directions. They don't have eye sockets. Um, they move the retinas behind the eyes around. I've got some videos, there are other great videos online that show this. You can actually see it happening. But they use those forward facing eyes to um, make images. And then they use the eyes that are kind of up beside them to for depth perception. How far do I have to jump to catch this prey or to get away or something? And then I'm not sure what these eyes in the back are for, but I think, I assume they're mainly for detecting motion and things coming near and shadows and such as that. But we use this, um, so here's a, a brown recluse and it only has six eyes in this configuration. So this is, the, that configuration of eyes is often a determiner of family, not always, but it, for many families, it often tells us what family it belongs to. Um, so you can find another one in here. Uh, and then wolf spiders, <clears throat> uh, which have a distinctive eye arrangement too. They have two big eyes, which they use to see. They don't see as well as jumping spiders. They have four eyes and a mustache, and I'm really not sure what that's for. <laughs> and then two eyes on the sides of the head, probably for detecting things nearby. So. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, um, and I don't, I can't say what, the, um, for different groups, they're gonna have slightly different uses for those eyes. Um, so it all depends on the group. That's what that's I- That's crazy I, that they're so different in the arrangement of their eyes. I just think that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, next question is, they're curious as to why you don't have any photos of tarantulas, especially our Texas ground. <laughs> she said they've had a long, long, lifelong fear of them, but when they moved to Austin, they saw their first one and they got a little better with them. Um, so. that's, that's great. Another great observation. Yeah, no photos of tarantulas in here. In fact, no Mike Gallimores, which is the group of, that the tarantulas belong to. So um, yeah, it's great that, you, that you're starting to overcome that fear of tarantulas. Um, experience seems to do that to us. So they build up into something in our imaginations. It just, that doesn't fit the real world. And once you get to know the real world, you see that the imagination is way off. But yeah, okay, there's a reason why I don't have tarantulas in here, actually. And previous presentations explain this, which is why I, I guess this question is the first time this question has come up. Um, <clears throat> so tarantulas are very popular. You can find books on them in bookstores. You can find them in the, in the pet shop. There are Discovery Channel episodes on them over and over and, and all sorts of Animal Planet and you know episodes. Whenever they do a spider program, it's mostly about tarantulas. When I first got into spiders, I was getting calls from TV show producers to ask me to help them make a tarantula show. And I'm like, the, tr the world is inundated with tarantulas. And these other poor other guys, which are far more numerous and diverse, um, get, you know, they're shortchanged. So I really focused on this group, which are the Iranian morphs. And the Iranian morphs are, are considered more modern than um, the mygalomorphs, which include tarantulas. There's there only like a few ton million years difference between them probably. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, the Iranian morph spiders, they have pinchers, I'm not sorry, pinchers. They have fangs, they, they can act like pinchers and they can come together like this. So they can hold things and they can be up in a web and they can hold prey while they're up suspended in the web. Whereas tarantulas and other mygalomorphs, they strike more like snakes do. And they can't really hold things together with their fangs. Um, so it's considered a more recent adaptation to be, be more dexterous with their prey. There are many other differences between them. That's one of the more interesting ones. So yeah, so I've become a tarantula for the underdog. And that's, did I say tarantula? I've become a champion for the underdog. <laughs> and so the Iranian works for underdogs. So that's what I focus on. Well, I think that's a great answer. I, I love that. So um, next up we have, are there any spiders that can change colors similar to anoles, which are a green lizard? Uh, what was the second part? Are there any spiders that can change colors and what? Uh, like a nose. Oh, like a nose. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, mainly the crab spiders. So mainly the spiders that I study. Um, 
pull that up again. So the two spiders on the left here are the same species, both females. The two spiders at the top are the same species, a different species. This is Mechaphysa solera at the top, yellow and white. Mechaphysa dubia on the left, different patterns. Okay, and I'm not sure what the bottom two are here. <laughs> so crab spiders do that. Now, there's also a species that I've never seen in central Texas, which is supposed to be here. Um, not very common here, very common further north and east. It's Masumina vadia, the goldenrod crab spider. The goldenrod crab spider is uh, famous for being able to change colors. You can relocate a spider, like a goldenrod crab spider, onto a different color, like from a white flower to a yellow flower. And over a few days, that spider will change from white to yellow. Um, and so they, 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 they camouflage themselves to the, the, um, the flower. And it's thought to help prevent them, uh, hide them from their predators, wasps and birds. They're visible to pollinators because they have um, UV patterns on them that attract pollinators to them. <clears throat> but um, the Mechaphysa group, which is the main group I study, they change colors a little differently. So spiders have to molt in order to grow. And it's a really fascinating process, which I could explain sometime. Um, <clears throat> it's much like how a butterfly uh, ecloses, emerges from the pupa. <clears throat> but they have, to, they have to molt in order to grow. And <clears throat> it's only at each molt that Mechaphysa changes color, primarily. The Mechaphysa can lose some color when I bring them indoors before molting, but the dramatic color transformations only happen, seem to only happen between molts. Um, and then the transformation makes them, I believe, I don't have scientific data to back this, seems to make them better match to whatever environment they had been in their prior molt, regardless of where they are now. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, uh, kind of a quick question here, since we, we, we still have several questions in here, we got about 10 minutes left, um, is do we have huntsmen in this country? Oh, yes. We have the, um, so the family is sporacity. And um, I don't think they make it up into uh, Austin, but we've got them in San Antonio. We've got, the, they're called the giant crab spiders, even though they aren't crab spiders. It's Oleos is the genus. Um, and it's called a giant crab spider, but they're, they're in San Antonio. And they're, they're farther um, west as well. And, um, and I think we've got a few other species too. And then we also have an introduced huntsman uh, along the Gulf Coast. I think it might be, Southern California too by now, I'm not sure. And this is um, Heteropoda, Heteropoda venatoria. I forgot where it's introduced from, but it's, it's our biggest huntsman. Uh, I forgot what the leg span can be, maybe like three and a half inches, four inches or something. Um, and they love the walls and um, houses, <laughs> but they tend to stay on the walls. All right. Um, we have two questions about uh, black and yellow garden spiders. Um, the first one is they've seen a lot of them recently. Is there a reason for their, their sudden abundance in their area? And then someone else asked, some of our black and yellow garden spiders create two egg sacs and some just one. Is that a function of food availability or something else? Yeah. So black and yellow garden spiders. Let's make sure everybody knows what we're talking about here. Uh... I've got a better photo on the other, other side. <clears throat> so where's that one going to be? It's going to be this one. Where is it? There we go. Okay, this is a really fat one. <laughs> okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, um, so the, the black and, uh, what were the, the, the one question was about food and egg sacs. What was the other question? 
um, about their sudden abundance. They're seeing oh, a lot of them at okay. their house. Yeah, so they're, I mean, they hatch in the spring. I mean, so they're around, they're just getting bigger fast. Uh, they tend to eat very large prey. They tend to make small webs. They tend to be big spiders compared to their size of their webs, which means, and their webs are very sticky, which means they can catch large insect prey. And they tend to catch things like grasshoppers. And grasshoppers are really juicy and great for them. So they, they, they get fat fast. So they, they grow fast and more conspicuous in a hurry. And I think that's the reason why they're so noticeable all of a sudden. Also, when they're little, um, like we saw in the other slide, um, they can hide in the grass and you don't see them. But when they get big, they need to get up out of the grass in a bigger web and to catch grasshoppers that are flying or jumping through. So, and so, yeah, so spiders, the more food a spider gets, the more egg sacs they're likely to make. Um, <clears throat> that's my impression. Uh, I don't know if they're born, I, I assume they're born with this fixed number of eggs. Um, but I have seen in the spiders that I have raised, the more often I feed them, the more egg sacs they make. And so I don't think there's a fixed amount for most spiders. For some spiders, they like lay two or three eggs. We've got some jumping spiders that make like three eggs and they do it three times and you know that's all they've got. Um, like um, some ant mimic jumping spiders. Most spiders, I don't, I think it, it just varies. I'm not aware of any species fixedness to it. Okay, the next question is about spider identification. She said, as you remembered how you learned to identify spiders during your talk, do you have any high level tips to share for others just beginning in the spider world? Yeah, get one of those field guides. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, so get Bradley's field guide, kind of expensive. Or, um, oh, another way to do it, post photos to um, bug guide, um, make guesses about what it is. And then when you're corrected, you can ask, well, why did you do that? And someone might respond giving the answer so you can get correction that way. Um, follow me and other uh, arachnologists on Twitter. We are very active and we help people who ask questions on Twitter. And um, <clears throat> so as far as getting into it seriously, like getting into, if you wanna definitively know what you're looking at, you're gonna have to learn to do dissection and preserve spiders in ethanol. And you're gonna need a, an expensive microscope or to go into a lab that has an expensive microscope. Um, it, get, it gets more expensive. I would start with just seeing what you can learn through you know, uh, field marks. There's a lot you can learn through field marks, especially to identify families as a start. And then if you get more serious, we're gonna start to get to know you and we can help you at that point, <laughs> help you at, at the next level at that point. Yep, I've already put both the books that you recommended on my wish list. I'll be purchasing them myself. So oh, great. Thank you for that. Um, next question was, I have uh, brown recluse spiders in my house, and they scare me. How can I learn to live with them without fear? And that's a tough question, but yeah. Yeah, excellent. I had brown recluses in the house I lived in last. I lived in that house for 16 years, I believe. <laughs> They weren't terribly common, but I would find them occasionally on the walls or in a corner. And I had a um, an AC closet that uh, would have them like half the time I opened it. I knew they'd be there, I just opened it. And it's convenient if I ever needed to see one or show one, you know, I'd say, hey, they're in here. I, this is where some of them like to hang out. <laughs> um, so um, <clears throat> I, there are quite a few things I can say that might help. And, um, so first of all, um, from the data that doctors have definitively gathered from about brown recluse spikes, which isn't very much, a few hundred records, I believe, that I'm aware, that I'm aware of, um, uh, it was apparent that only one out of 10 bites became necrotic, um, that it started killing tissue. Well, nine out of 10 healed without issue. And we don't know why that is. 
uh, we um, it could be because the different spiders have different concoctions, different individuals have different concoctions and some are more dangerous. It could be that it the spider um, gets you in uh, just the right spot on your body. Um, we're not sure why. Um, we don't get enough uh, volunteers for the experiments, unfortunately. Um, so they're um, so they're not as dangerous as they're made out to be. Uh, not always. I mean, they can be, but not usually. I mean, I once uh, someone sent a photo to me of the back of a photo of a baby's back and uh, a half crushed spider, which, which was clearly a brown recluse. The baby had rolled over onto on its back onto a spider, and the spider trying to get out was constantly being crushed by this baby and bit the baby like 10 times in 10 different spots along the back. And they said, what do I do? And I said, the only thing I can do is say, go to the hospital. I, said, I, I can't do anything else. Um, <clears throat> and two days later, no evidence of the bites at all, completely cleared up, no reaction, nothing. Um, so there's also um, a study you can find online of a house, mm, Kansas, Tennessee, I forget where it was, that um, an arachnologist went through and counted like 2,000 spiders visible in this house. It was an old house. 2,000 brown recluse spiders in the house with a family that had been living there for like a decade or so. Never had any of them been bitten. Not once had any of them been bitten by a brown recluse. And I have more stories to share about that. Of people I know who live with brown recluses, you can see them in their houses. And they say, the, the pest control people say, we can't get rid of them except by burning the house down. And we've never been bitten, so we just leave them. <laughs> what I do, what I did is I kept my bed away from the wall because they tend to go on corners and up walls. Just keep the bed away from the wall, your clothes off the floor. If you really want to be keep careful, pull your dresser a few inches away from the wall. Um, I know one person who found a brown recluse on their shower towel when they pulled it off. Check your shower towel and washcloth before you use it. If you do that, I don't think you're going to have any issues. <laughs> Excellent. And with that, we have reached the hour mark. So we got to most of the questions. There were a couple left. But um, to respect everybody's time, we'll go ahead and stop there. Uh, I just want to thank you for, for coming today. It was great. So much good information. Um, and thank you very much. for. You're welcome. Had a ball. Thank you, everybody.